This conference will now be recorded. Well, for me, it was only uh, recently learning about these research findings from a meta-analysis published in 2010 by Holt Lundstedt, Smith & Layton, which revealed that a lack of social relationships was found to be as much of a risk factor for premature mortality as smoking half a pack of cigarettes per day, that I found to, um, that I only began to realize how significant an issue this was. As, you, as a registered nurse, I spent the last 10 years counseling patients on modifying their risk factors for disease, but not having this knowledge at this time, this was not something that I would have discussed with my patients. Now that I was aware of this significant risk factor, I wanted to learn more about it. After I started digging into this topic a little deeper, I learned that social isolation and loneliness was associated with a number of adverse physical and mental health outcomes, including cardiovascular disease and depression. I also learned that there was an existing body of research which helped to explain the contextual factors associated with social isolation and loneliness. However, one area which has been especially lacking in this regard was the built environment. Therefore, to better understand this, I used this research question. What is the association between the built environment and loneliness and social isolation? Using the databases CINAHL, Medline, and PsycInfo, as well as two frameworks developed by Health Evidence, my search strategy revealed 71 articles for review. Once I began uh, digging into these research findings, I initially quite struggled with how to conceptualize this intersection between the built environment and social isolation and loneliness in a way that made sense. The reason for this being that the built env environment is a man-made construct, and therefore the way we interact with the built environment, and conversely, the influence of the built environment on us is an incredibly complex, uh, complex process. We build and adapt our environment for a myriad of reasons, of which many are not mutually exclusive. So I sought out a model which I felt could be helpful in conceptualizing these findings. And it was this model here, the so social ecological model, that I selected as the framework I would use. The reason I chose this model specifically was because it considered the interactions of health determinants on a particular issue by considering the context seen here. So at the, at the center, we can see that we have the biology of disease or an in, innate behaviors, and then moving outwards, individual behaviors, social, family, and community networks, living and working conditions, and finally, the broader social construct. So to create a framework by which my results could be organized and understood, each research article was categorized as falling into one of the six themes you see listed here. The home, supportive housing, the workplace, rolling urban communities, built community services, and other. Then the social ecological model was applied to each article to determine which um, level or levels the research findings fell within. And if, this, if that was confusing for anyone, here is a snapshot of what this would have looked like. So at the top left-hand corner, you can see that these were, the arti these, uh, were articles where the research findings centered around the home. And then for each article um, in the row across, uh, the context of each social ecological lens that the research focused on was applied here. And so that is the uh, vertical colored, colored columns. After reviewing each article through uh, the social ecological lens, my findings were as follows. So likely unsurprising to many, the home was a large focus of the research findings. Here, multiple social ecological levels were found to positively or negatively uh, be associated with social and isolation and loneliness. For instance, being homebound was determined to be associated with an increased likelihood of becoming lonely. And a number of risk factors were found to increase the likelihood of an individual becoming homebound, including having an elevated body mass index, being of lower socioeconomic status, or having a poor or chronic health condition such as multiple, multiple sclerosis or stroke. One unfortunate example of this that I came across in the research was the story of a mother diagnosed with multiple sclerosis who had become confined to the upper level of her house since she was not able to use the stairs to get to the main floor. Understandably, this left her feeling disconnected with not only the greater community, but her immediate family as well. An example at the community level where factors in the built environment contribute to social connectedness was a residential hotel in San Francisco where a large number of marginalized individuals with HIV live. 
Here, these residents shared that this community, one of acceptance and freedom from being judged, added greatly to their sense of connecting with others. Another positive example at the societal level was the concept of aging in place. And to anyone unfamiliar with this term, it refers to individuals remaining in their long-term home rather than moving to a more supportive environment, such as a long-term care facility, for example. It's important here to mention, though, that uh, aging in place is not for everyone, and indeed, we know that some individuals do better in a supportive alternative environment. The next environment my findings centered on were supportive housing which refers to an environment where people receive physical and or mental health support. This could include assisted living facilities, community-based supportive housing, or subsidized housing as examples. Here the findings were really quite mixed and were found to be dependent upon the demographics of the co-occupants. For instance, one example where a supportive housing environment contributed to increased social isolation and loneliness was the story of a 53-year-old gentleman with Parkinson's who had to live in a care home where the other residents were 20 to 30 years older than he was. I know I've certainly encountered clients whose story quite closely mirrors this one in my previous nursing practice. Where an individual lives was also found to influence social isolation and loneliness. Here the research could be divided into two categories. Um, sorry, where an individual works. Uh, professional isolates and teleworkers. Professional isolates refers to those who live in, live and work in remote and isolated communities, such as research stations in the Antarctic or a mining town. Here, research centered largely around how individual, um, individual characteristics acted as a perfect, protective factor to being in this environment. For instance, individuals who work in research stations in the Antarctic are not unsurprisingly more likely to be introverted. Teleworkers, or those who work away from traditional workplaces, such as at, um, at home or in a coffee shop, were associated uh, with increased feelings of isolation, which again is an likely an unsurprising finding. The fourth thing that I looked at was the effect of the built environment within rural and urban geographies. Here I found that the theme centered predominantly at the individual, community, and societal level. One example I think demonstrates this quite well was a study which came out of the U.S. that found that Latino immigrant women in rural communities experienced social isolation and loneliness because of a number of factors. For example, in this study within this specific culture, these women, these women rely on their husbands for transportation. So in rural environments where public transportation isn't an, op an option, you can easily see how this would make it more challenging for them to interact with other individuals if the distance might be for too far for them to walk, for instance. At the community level in an urban setting, a novel idea which I was certainly unfamiliar with before starting this research was the idea of naturally occurring retirement communities or NORTs. For anyone unfamiliar with this term, NORTs are communities where a large proportion of in older adults can be found as a result of natural migratory patterns. So basically what happens is individuals and families move into a community and they live there for a long period of time and indeed retire and age in that same community. Typically in these communities, we see a great deal of social connectedness because individuals um, typically live here for a long period of time. This reason is important to recognize um, in order to ensure that uh, individuals living in NORC populations are well supported so that they can continue to ensure social connect connectedness with each other. At the, <clears throat> at the broader social level, a focal, focus of this research found that challenges arising from physical barriers to neighborhood access. To highlight this, one study out of Manitoba looked at the impact of snow removal services on an individual's ability to move about society if they were wheelchair bound. This study specifically found that when faced with barriers such as snow, uh, these individuals spent a great deal more time indoors during the winter months than during the warmer weather season. Similarly, the deterioration of physical environments such as um, the streets and sidewalks created challenges for those with physical or vis visual limitations. My final theme to review with you today was perhaps my favorite since this research looked at some pretty innovative ideas that could increase social connectedness. One example of this that uh, was quite prevalent in the research was the use of dementia cafes in the United Kingdom. Uh, the research focused 
predominantly on the UK, prob probably because it, um, you, dementia cafes have been around for a long time there, but we certainly have them in Canada as well. In these cafes, um, individuals who are affected by Alzheimer's disease or dementia or care for individuals with dementia are able to come together to spend time and share their experiences about having lived experience with, experiences with dementia or caring for, for their loved ones. The development of community uh, collective kitchens and recreational facilities was also demonstrated in this uh, theme to increase social connectedness. So after considering the findings of this review, I came up with two conclusions as presented here. The first being that it's not our built environment that leads to social isolation and loneliness, but rather it's the unintended health inequities created within our environment that result from how our environment is built. And second, that the barriers and challenges to social engagement and connectedness arising from the built environment are complex and multifactorial. And therefore, the strategies that we create in order to reduce these barriers and challenges must also be multifaceted. So where did this bring me? Truthfully, after researching this topic, um, the way that I look at my environment and community completely changed. And so I began to wonder, if we look at the research findings, and especially what we know and what we didn't know, where could we go as a society from here? So I went back to the social, social ecological model and I reflected upon the research with the following considerations. If we look at each social ecological level, what additional research is needed? And based on what we knew, what could be some of the implications for public policy? And so after considering this, this conceptual framework was developed. <clears throat> um, at the individual level, for instance, you can see here that one area where additional research is needed is around the idea of developing risk assessment tools for primary care practitioners to identify patients who might be at risk to social isolation and loneliness with considerations of the impact of the built environment. An example of a policy at the individual level could include the training of those with developmental disabilities to help them utilize public transportation. To help this, this develop this model, I of course had to consider the gaps in the research, and here are a few listed. For instance, I identified that more research is needed to understand how marginalized or disenfranchised populations, such as the homeless and those affected by substance abuse, um, are, are impacted by the built environment. The study around the residential hotel in San Francisco was one of the few that did this in my research findings. As well, very few articles focus on specific cultural or ethnic backgrounds. So for example, I didn't find anything on our, the impact of the built environment on our Aboriginal population in the North. Finally, though this research did not specifically seek to locate evidence-based strategies to identify, control, and mitigate environmental circumstances for those at risk, there appears to be a lack of research in this area. Some limitations of this research that I found was the challenges of applying some of the research to a larger scale, especially when the research was conducted on highly specific populations, such as Latino Americans in rural communities, for example. And further, uh, since this research looked at only the academic literature, the use of gray literature could have been quite helpful to help augment these findings, even if anecdotally, in order to support or dispute uh, some of the research findings that were found. In conclusion, the association between the built environment and social isolation and loneliness is an incredibly complex phenomenon. Factors within our built environment have the potential to have a significant impact on our ability to connect with others and therefore our health and well-being. This review demonstrates that much work is needed in the form of research and policy to help us work together to create an equitable society in which everyone may become socially engaged, no matter their culture, age, physical or mental limitations, income or status within society. Thank you. Thank you, Amber. Um, we're going to keep questions for Amber till the end of the seminar. Um, so um, I guess for now, we'll move on to Sara. Yes. And I forgot to mention at the beginning, um, if you have any questions for Amber and Sara throughout their presentations, feel free to enter them into the chat box, and we'll get to them at the end of the presentations. Thanks, Sara. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. Thank you, Tina, for the lovely introduction. And I also wanted to extend a thank you to the National Collaborating Center for Environmental Health for selecting my paper for the Rhonda Berger Student Award and for this opportunity to speak to all of you today. I am happy to be following my classmate, Amber, and today I will be presenting on my evidence review, a knowledge synthesis of computer keyboards in hospitals as a reservoir for methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus MRSA infection. Today we will be exploring, are computer keyboards transmitting more than words? I will start with defining my research question for this literature review. Then we will take a look at the hospital environment, prevalence of nosocomial infections, and the impact of modern medicine. From there, we will go through the chain of infection, prevention measures, barriers, and end with next steps. In light of recent findings on the role of the inanimate hospital environment and nosocomial infections, this literature review seeks to examine the current evidence surrounding computer keyboards as reservoirs from MRSA infection in hospital settings, highlighting gaps in both knowledge and policy. This is a flow chart of the literature search results. This literature review was conducted using the electronic database Google Scholar. The main literature search was restricted to articles from peer-reviewed journals published in English between the years 2000 and 2018. The database was searched using the following keywords, MRSA infection, computer keyboard, and ICU hospital. From the search of keywords, 817 articles were retrieved from the database. The article titles were screened for relevance to the topic of MRSA and computer keyboards. Abstracts of 115 articles with relevant titles were then reviewed to determine the level of appropriateness for this particular evidence review. 30 articles were read and examined in entirety. Articles were selected based on their relevance to and testing of the MRSA pathogen and MRSA infection with regard to computer keyboards in hospital settings around the world. Articles discussing hand hygiene and the cross-contamination of MRSA to computers, as well as relevant policy prevention and cleaning of computer surfaces in the hospital, specifically in the OR, ICU, and hospital wards were included. Articles pertaining solely to other pathogens and nosocomial infections and other inanimate objects were excluded for the purposes of this review. 16 articles from the Google Scholar database met inclusion criteria and were included in this literature review out of 817 articles retrieved from the search. I created this visual and to show the country of origin for the articles included. Computer keyboard surfaces were tested for contamination of pathogens in various studies from the following countries, Canada, United States of America, United Kingdom, Iran, Thailand, Taiwan, Italy, Germany, India, Republic of Korea, Republic of South Africa, and Japan. For more information on the articles included in article summaries, my paper is available on the NCCEH website. Modern medicine and computer technology has been adopted around the world in the recording of patient information, and MRSA was prominent globally, suggesting that this is a universal public health concern. So let's zoom in and take a closer look at the hospital environment. You are probably all familiar with the typical hospital environment. Hospital-acquired infections, also referred to as nosocomial infections, have become increasingly prominent as a cause of morbidity and mortality within a hospital setting. These infections result in severe health and financial challenges for patients and healthcare systems around the world. For example, over 2 million patients acquire nosocomial infections, resulting in 90,000 deaths in the United States each year, which leads to a financial burden exceeding $4.5 billion. Many of the articles focused on research in the ICU, as environmental contamination in the ICU can be riskier, as patients are in a vulnerable state and transmission can occur with increased interactions between patient and healthcare providers. Patients in the ICU can have additional factors leading to increased susceptibility of nosocomial infections, including being at an increased risk for infections, the age extremes from very young patients to very old patients, victims of trauma, 
those who are immunocompromised or immunosuppressed. Within a hospital environment, there are a number of important nosocomial pathogens. MRSA is a nosocomial infection. A Canadian study from 2013, looking at survey results from patients in 176 acute care hospitals, looked at rates of colonization or infection in patients from one of three bacterial microbes. MRSA, VRE, and C. difficile. On any given day, one in 12 Canadian adults in the hospital have MRSA or another of the mentioned superbugs. From here, one quarter to one third of patients colonized with MRSA actually become infected, and from there, a significant number will sadly succumb to this infection. Methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA, is a gram-positive bacteria, and this pathogen leads to severe skin staph infection. MRSA can colonize and infect individuals. Some people normally have MRSA on their body. This bacteria can colonize the nose, skin, and other moist areas on the body. MRSA infection is when the bacteria makes people sick and symptomatic. It's an emerging public health threat for two main reasons. One, the survival time of this pathogen on surfaces is anywhere from seven days to over 12 months. And reason two, many strains of MRSA are antibiotic resistant, making the infection challenging to treat. This is a comic I was shown in my infectious disease class that I thought was quite relevant to today's talk. It's showing the diversity of people and pathogens within a hospital setting as well as how easily pathogens can spread within this type of environment, and stresses the importance of preventative measures such as hand washing. Within a hospital environment, there are a number of different pathogens and a number of sources of infection, as can be seen in this image. The role of the hospital environment with regard to increased nosocomial infection rates has been a controversial debate. Today, we will be focusing on cross-transmission of microorganisms occurring by healthcare providers as they go back and forth between interacting with patients and recording patient information on contaminated equipment, specifically the computer. The inanimate environment of the hospital can harbor pathogens on surfaces. Common contaminated surfaces of inanimate objects, also referred to as fomites, including chairbacks, stethoscopes, and handrails, have gathered attention. Surfaces such as chairbacks and handrails were at increased odds of being contaminated with MRSA, yet computer keyboards should not be disregarded. Colonization rates for computer keyboards are greater than many other user interfaces in the ICU. Studies have shown that 92% to 98.5% of computers are colonized with pathogens such as Bacillus species, Micrococcus, E. coli, and Enterobacter species, with 1.8 to 15% of computers specifically contaminated by MRSA. The advent of modern medicine has paved the way for electronic patient records. Hospital computers are used for data storage, communication, and knowledge sharing. They assist in surgical procedures and are commonly used for diagnostic testing. Computer keyboards are commonly classified as high-touch surfaces, as there has been an increase in the number of computers and their use. All 16 articles showed that there was some degree of pathogen contamination on computer keyboards sampled in hospital settings. Out of the 16 articles reviewed, 11 identified MRSA as a source of contamination, while the remaining five articles reported contamination, but the pathogens were unspecified. This table is from the British study showing that all 48 computer keyboards tested were contaminated with organisms and majority of growth was moderate and heavy. It is undisputed that hands are the main source of pathogen transmission in the hospital environment. ICU staff were aware that keyboards are an important source of nosocomial infection and furthermore, 82% of doctors and 40.3% of nurses admitted to never washing their hands before or after computer use.
This is a problem as 15 out of the 16 articles reviewed identified computer keyboards as reservoirs for microorganisms in the OR and ICU. Many of the articles focused on research in the ICU, as environmental contamination in the ICU can be riskier as patients are in a vulnerable state and transmission can occur with increased interactions between patient and healthcare providers. There are six components to the chain of infection, the infectious agent, the reservoir, the portal of exit, mode of transmission, portal of entry, and susceptible host. All six components must align from presence of infectious agent to a susceptible host to lead to infection. I focused on the presence of an infectious agent, MRSA, and the reservoir, computer keyboards, in this review. There has been a push for hand hygiene policies and promotion in the hospital setting, although efforts need to be taken to promote and raise awareness of the importance in infection control. As even with implementation of hand washing policies, there is variance in compliance. With good hand hygiene, compliance upwards of 74%, there was low contamination rates of MRSA on computers. Regular cleaning and disinfecting of computer keyboards proved to be effective as ethanol removed upwards of 93% of pathogens in different hospitals. Though if not routinely cleaned, MRSA clusters were identified two to four weeks post-cleaning. It is recommended to clean and disinfect computer keyboards regularly and routinely, as well as if there is visible dirtiness. However, regular is defined differently from hospital to hospital. Other unique forms of controlling pathogen contamination on computer keyboards are the use of plastic covers, flat silicone coated surface keyboards that prevent pathogen adherence on the surface, or an alarm system that sets reminders to clean the computer after use. A novel technology that is being investigated for efficacy is the use of UV lamps to decontaminate computer keyboards. It is promising as there is minimal interruption and requires only low UV exposure. However, further research is required to evaluate its effectiveness and feasibility. Although further research is required at this time, hand hygiene compliance and regular cleaning and disinfecting are practical and have the potential to save hospitals money and save patients lives. Alarmingly, questionnaire results from healthcare providers concluded that 97% of respondents were not aware of an official policy for computer equipment cleaning. Awareness of computer keyboard pathogen contamination is imperative as this is a preventable public health issue. Raising awareness is step one. However, once aware of computer keyboard contamination, the problem is the lack of knowledge and common practices on how to clean it well and efficiently. There are a number of barriers to cleaning computer keyboards that should be mentioned. Keyboards have many individual keys, making them challenging to clean thoroughly at times. Studies show keyboards with flat keys are easier to clean. There can be a fear of damaging expensive shared technological equipment. It can be time consuming. People may forget to clean without reminders around or without observing others following similar procedures. And a recurring barrier observed in this review is not knowing the recommended infection control protocol. These barriers exist and efforts need to be made and strategies modified to mitigate these barriers and improve cleanliness of computer keyboards in a hospital setting. Hand hygiene is important for everyone and is commonly stressed within the hospital environment as we see hand sanitizer stations and posters around. This image is from the Just Clean Your Hands campaign launched in 2008 which is a multifaceted hand hygiene program for Ontario hospitals. Clean hands must become part of the workplace culture. This program is a multifaceted intervention that aims to help hospitals overcome the barriers to proper hand hygiene and improve compliance with hand hygiene best practices. This approach includes education for healthcare providers about when and how to clean their hands, environmental changes and system supports like alcohol-based hand rub at the point of care, ongoing monitoring and observation of hand hygiene practices with feedback provided to the healthcare providers, champion and leaders modeling the right behavior, patient engagement, for example, 
example, informing the patient of hand hygiene important and that they can ask their healthcare provider if they've washed their hands prior and post patient contact. And senior management support, making this an organizational priority. Ultimately, higher hand hygiene compliance rates leads to fewer infections, and that is the goal for a safer hospital environment and better patient experience. A major reason behind the lack of consensus regarding the hospital environment's role in nosocomial microorganism transmission is the innate challenge in objectively demonstrating that any one environmental surface contamination proceeds and results in pathogen transmission and patient infection. Other factors to consider include the duration of contact with computers, number of users, and number of times contact was made in a given time period. Molecular typing of the isolates from patients with MRSA infection, if any, healthcare providers' hand samples, and computer contamination samples could shed light on the course and extent of transmission within the hospital environment, although this was beyond the scope of this review. There is an extensive amount of evidence on hand washing, and several of the articles examin examining hand washing compliance may be biased by the Hawthorne effect which could have modified behavior, increasing compliance rates. A limitation is there are differences between the hospitals and countries included in this review. The collection of samples were not standardized, and there are difference in, differences in culture and policy that were not accounted for in this review. Further research is required on MRSA contamination in hosp Canadian hospitals, and a closer look at policy changes for hand washing and cleaning practices. In light of the evidence presented in this knowledge synthesis, the implications of computer keyboard contamination must be considered in regard to patient health, as computer keyboards seem to be transmitting more than words. Pathogens and computers are all around us, beyond a healthcare setting. Although the focus of this review is in the context of computer contamination in the hospital environment, many of the concepts transcend into other environments, from our personal life, to other work settings and school. So remember, stopping infection is in our hands. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Sarah. So do we have any questions in the room here? Yes. Yeah, hi. Uh, my question goes to the first presenter. Very nice talk. Uh, I gathered, uh, I understood from your talk that many cultural uh, variables came up in uh, regard to uh, loneliness. I wonder why uh, not language and newcomers uh, were mentioned. Because you know, if you look at your uh, classmates or your uh, co-workers, if the language is different, it's a kind of uh, isolation, uh, the cause of isolation, particularly for the old people who are uh, who cannot speak the uh, the language. It's it would be very difficult to to be in communication with others. I wonder if you can comment on that. Sure, I, I can certainly say that that's a really great point and, and it's an interesting one because certainly exactly what you're saying, I, I didn't come across that in the research. Um, and definitely culture in and of itself was an, an identified gap that definitely needs some further exploration. So I would certainly add to that um, some research around the need to explore how language can intersect with the built environment to uh, result in social isolation and loneliness, definitely. Thank you. Any other questions in the room? Um, this is also for the first presenter. Um, it looks like you came up with a bunch of policy recommendations related to um, your topic, and I was just wondering what your favorite one is or what you think might have the biggest impact. That's a, that's a really great question. Let's have a look. <laughs> um, I think I think definitely some policy around some surveillance and identification of po of um, populations that are at risk. So if we could um, build in policies that would do this, 
specifically, I think one policy that would be, if I had a magic wand, uh, would be um, instrumental would be to develop um, or complete a health equity impact assessment anytime um, a new environmental strategy is undertaken to see if that would um, result in unintended health inequities for different populations. Yeah, thanks. Any other question? I can't ask another. Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, this question goes to the second presenter. Very nice talk. Thank you. Uh, during your talk, you mentioned uh, that the keyboards should be cleaned uh, frequently and in a routine basis and de disinfected. I wonder what chemical are you suggesting to uh, disinfect the keyboards uh, frequently with? Yeah, so I, through the studies that I read, um, ethanol seemed to be a common disinfectant, um, as well as wipes and other, those are the common two that I saw, wipes and ethanol. Um, I am sure there are other disinfectants and cleaning procedures that go along with it, but those are the two most common um, from the articles in my review. Thank you. So just uh, following along that question, are there specially designed uh, keyboards for hospital use that are sealed um, in a way that would make it easier and faster to clean, or designed in some other way to to make them easier to clean or prevent the, the um, spread of infection? Yes. So they did say that they're um, in the articles I read, um, some common ones were a flatter keyboard is generally easier to clean as there's not, the keys don't have as much space in between um, for things to get in, as well as silicone covered keys were common, um, another common way to prevent pathogen adherence on the keyboard itself. And also some places use plastic covers. So there are a number of new technologies that are around um, in terms of implementation it's hard to say how how much they're implemented and where they're implemented but they these are some examples of what is being done or potential solutions to maybe help mitigate some of the pathogen adherence onto the keyboards itself thanks thanks for that so, um, so we have a question um, online. Um, in their research, was there also recommendations for cleaning, et cetera, for computer mouses, mice? Yeah, so I focused on computer keyboards, but that I think encompasses the mouse, the computer terminal itself, and the keyboard. Everything that gets touched or could be touched is a high touch site. Um, so I think that the common procedures that occur with keyboards would also be um, relevant for mice and other technological components as well within the hospital environment. Thank you. Any other questions in the room or online? Okay, um, so just to, just to re promote some resources I know that are coming up, um, the BCCDC is producing um, health equity in a built environment toolkit, I believe, or um, it was a resource on health equity in the built environment as well as mental health in the built environment. I think that's coming out earlier, early next year. So um, if you would like to, to learn more about that, you can email me and I will put you in touch with the um, the, my colleague who's working on those resources. Um, and thank you so much to Amber and Sarah, and congratulations again on winning the student award. And their papers are available on the NCCH website along with the other winner um, from UBC, whose paper was on, um, I believe, uh, urban rats. So yeah, thanks everyone for joining and uh, have a great day.